Welcome everybody to the sixth lesson of the Rust curse and today we're going to talk about loops. So without further ado, let's get started. Right, so we start from the usual project and uh, in Rust there are three types of loops. There are for loops, there are while loops and then there is another type specifically made for endless loops. So we start from the latter and if you want to do an endless loop in other languages, what you should do normally is typing something like while well, true and then for example we print hello if we run it what we see is an endless list of hellos and rust offers a specific syntax for this use case which is the loop word and this code right here is completely equivalent to the previous one one of the nice things about rust is that you can handle return values in a very smart way Right, so it may happen that you want to use the loop to try an operation and then retry it until you get a result. For example, the operation may fail, may be a network request, and you want to iterate over and over until you get a result. So what you would do normally is just having a mutable variable as result, for example, equal to zero. And that, just for this example, we have a counter goes from zero to well, we increment it at each iteration, then if the counter is equal to 10, then the result is equal to counter times 2, and then we break. Of course, we have the break keyword as we have in most other languages. In the end, what do we do is printing the result. Okay? If we try to run it, as you will see, we get a number of hellos and then number 20, which is what we expect. This works, but we can do better in Rust. What we can do in a very similar way to, for example, conditions that are capable of returning values, we can delete the mutable keyword. And in general, in Rust, you should uh, try to avoid mutable variables when not needed because there are more elegant ways to achieve the goal. And then what we do, just say that the result is equal to the loop. And then keeping most of the old code, what do we do is that we delete this line. Then we say break counter times two. If we execute it, we get the same exact result as before. So the break keyword here acts sort of like a return statement of a function in this case. So it returns this value from the loop, which is very convenient. Then there is the usual while loop that I'm going to show you. For example, while counter is less than 10, then print hello, then we increment counter. Okay, and as you would expect, we get 10 hellos, which is uh, pretty useful in most situations. Then we have the final loop, which is the for loop. If you come from languages such as Java or JavaScript, it may seem a bit strange because you don't have the usual syntax such as for int i equals to zero i minus to len i plus plus. It's not like this, okay? You get a very similar thing that you would get, for example, using Python with ranges. So if you come from Python, you will be very familiar with ranges. What do we do, for example, to iterate between 0 and 9, typing 4, the name of the variable, i, in, and then you specify the range, for example, from 0 to 10 excluded, so from 0 to 9. If you want to also include the 10, you should put uh, the equal sign here. In this case, we don't want it. We delete the counter, and then just for this example, we print the value of i. So if we now run it, as you can see, we get hello one nine. One of the main use cases for the for loop is iterating through data structures. For example, we've seen already arrays. So array is equal to one, two, three, four. Iterate over this array. What we do is for i in, and then what we do is typing array dot iter. So I'm going to explain this a lot better in one of the next videos, but for now, just the thing that iter returns the iterator, which is needed for the for loop to iterate through all the elements. So if we now run this example, we see hello one, two, three, and four. And one of the nice things about iterators is that you can do a lot of things with them. For example, let's say that we want to iterate through 
this collection, but in the reverse order. So we just put that rev, which returns another iterator, but backwards. And if we now execute it, you see what we would expect, the exact result, but uh, in the other direction. This was all for this video. It was a very short introduction on Rust loops. If you liked it, please consider subscribing to the channel because it really helps. And uh, I hope to see you in the next video in which we are going to talk about ownership, which is a key concept in Rust. And uh, it will allow us to start making some serious code in Rust. So stay tuned.